Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 11 to 15. So first I'll show you guys a question so that you can attempt them on your own. Here's question 11, question 12, question 13, question 14, and question 15. Now we'll be going through the questions together. So question 11 is saying an impaired cerebral cortex is likely to produce which of the following symptoms? So we're saying the cerebral cortex is the one which has been impaired. So for this question, you need to know what are the functions of the cerebral cortex. And then if it's been damaged, we can say that those functions are no longer working properly in a person who's received this trauma. So the cerebral cortex, you should know that it's involved in things like thinking and being alert and things like that. So things of that nature. So we're looking for an answer which is closest to that. So something along with thinking. A is saying extreme mood swings, and that would be incorrect. This is more so the limbic system. B is saying impaired sex drive. That's not something which is specifically for the cerebral cortex, which is the outer layer of the brain. So it's not something which is mainly a function of the cerebral cortex. It's a bit more complicated and kind of spread out to different parts of the brain. So because of that, B is not the correct answer. C is saying impaired ability to, ability to balance. That would be related to the cerebellum. And so once again, not a function of the cerebral cortex. And so D is correct because we're talking about an impaired ability to think abstractly. Yes, this is one of the functions of the cerebral cortex. And therefore, if it's damaged, then we can say that we do expect an impaired ability to be able to have abstract thoughts. So therefore, D is the best answer for question 11. In question 12, it says syndrome of inappropriate ADH or SIADH. It's a condition where ADH is improperly released and is commonly seen in various cancers. Which of the following would be expected of a, in a patient with, who has this condition? So we're talking about ADH and it is improperly released. So ADH you should know is antidiuretic hormone and something which is a diuretic, what it does is it makes you pee a lot, so release water a lot, and an antidiuretic is something which holds in the water in your body. So when antidiuretic hormone is released, it's because your blood pressure has dropped. So your body has released this hormone to be able to bring back and reabsorb water from the kidney. And it does so by bringing in mainly water. So solute free water, just water is what it's bringing back in to the bloodstream. And then once this water comes back in, then we increase the volume of our blood and then we can restore blood pressure as well. So that is the purpose of antidiuretic hormone. And a closely related hormone is aldosterone. What aldosterone does is it plays around with the sodium levels. So it would try to like bring in more sodium. But in this case, we're talking about antidiuretic hormone, which is just bringing in water. So whatever, whatever ions we have or anything that we have floating around in the blood, because we have brought in more water, we have reduced the concentration of all of these different species that are within the blood. So option A is saying that if someone has a lot of ADH being released, they have low serum sodium, and that is correct. So low serum sodium means the concentration of sodium ions inside the blood. Yes, we can expect it to be low because we have a lot of water coming back in, and just as the nature of this water coming in, we're diluting the concentration of every species in the blood. So yes, we can say that our serum sodium is expected to be low. It's not expected to be high because if it was high, that would mean that we are having a lot of aldosterone being secreted and that's bringing in a lot of sodium, but we have antidiuretic hormone and that's the hormone which brings in a lot of water. C is saying a high urine chloride concentration, but this is not something we can so readily expect because with someone who does have a lot of antidiuretic hormone being released, since a lot of water is being brought back into the bloodstream, that means that the urine is going to be concentrated. And so the concentration of everything is going to be increased, but we can't specifically say that high urine chloride concentration is going to be expected. So it's not something that we can directly say because ADH is not really 
affecting the levels of chloride. There might be other factors that are affecting the concentration of chloride. So it's not clear why we would expect a lot of chloride inside the urine. It's just better to say that we have a low concentration in the blood of everything that's present in the blood. So it's better to talk about the blood because we can say that for sure. We have a low concentration of the different species. And then D is incorrect. A decreased blood pressure, that's incorrect because we're bringing in a lot more water into the bloodstream. So since we have so much blood flowing around in our circulation system, we're going to see a high blood pressure, not a decreased blood pressure. So A is the best answer for what we can expect of a patient with SIADH. In question 13, we're asked which of the following is included in the concept of extranuclear inheritance. So extranuclear inheritance, so the inheritance part of this, this statement, this um, term, means that you are passing on something, and then the extranuclear part means that we're passing on genes that are outside of the nucleus. So mostly when we're talking about the passing on of genes or DNA, then we're talking about the DNA that's stored in the nucleus in eukaryotes that goes from parent to offspring, but extranuclear DNA is genes outside of the nucleus. So that means that we're talking about things like the mitochondria, which has its own DNA. And we can also be talking about bacterial or virus DNA that's inside a parent that was passed on to offspring. That is also extranuclear DNA. But we're talking about DNA, not RNA. So in option A, it says ribosomal RNA that's passed to the offspring. No, that's not what this term is. RNA isn't really passed on. It's more so DNA. Extranuclear inheritance is talking about DNA because inside a nucleus we generally have DNA, whereas RNA, it, it can often be found outside of the nucleus. So we're talking about DNA, which is usually inside the nucleus, and then extranuclear is something special because DNA usually is not found outside of the nucleus in eukaryotes. B is saying genes located in the mitochondria pass off to pass to offspring. Yes. So passing on mitochondrial genes is encompassed in the in this concept. C is saying genes within the nucleus after telophase passed off to offspring. No. So C is the correct is the exact opposite because it's talking about just normal DNA inside the nucleus being inherited. That's just normal passing on or passing on of genes or normal inheritance. And then finally D is saying cytoskeletal elements being passed to offspring. No. We're talking about inheritance of genes in this concept of extra nuclear inheritance. So we're only talking about genes or DNA. In question 14, we're asked which of the following term matches with this definition. A codon will code for one and only one amino acid. So we can get a list of different codons, a codon table, which is a set of three nucleotides that when they are read together will tell the ribosome to code for a specific amino acid. So that's what a codon is, the set of three nucleotides. And option A is saying degenerative. What does degenerative mean? It does not mean what's given to us in the question stem. Degenerative means that in a codon, we have some leniency where we can change the, change the third nucleotide and it can still code for the same amino acid. So an example here is we have CUU and then CUC. Even though we changed the third nucleotide, both of these ended up coding for leucine. So when these are red, the ribosome knows to code for leucine. So it codes for the same amino acid in the end. That would be talking about something being degenerative, which is not the same as what's said in the question stem. The question stem says a codon will code for one and only one amino acid. It's talking about just one codon. So for example, if I'm just talking about CUU, it's saying that this will only code for leucine and it won't code for alanine or any of the other amino acids. So CUU or this specific codon or nucleotide combination will always code for the same amino acid. And it's pretty significant because this, this codon that we have it is found across all kinds of different organisms. So not just closely related organisms, but all different kinds of organisms throughout biology. So A is incorrect. B, universal coding, that is pretty much what I just mentioned. The fact that this code that we have is found throughout all of biology, but that's not the, the term that we're talking about right now. The term that we're talking about is a codon only coding for one amino acid and then no other amino acid. That is 
best matched up with the term in option C. So unambiguous, it's not ambiguous what the codon will code for, which amino acid. It's not like it can shift around a few times. It's not ambiguous or unclear at all. It's 100% clear that CUU, it will always code for leucine. CUC, same thing. That combination, you ever see it, it's gonna code for leucine. So it's unambiguous, it's very clear. That is the definition which matches up with the term that we're given in the question stem. And then D, selective, that's not really any term that relates to codons and transcription or translation, translation of mRNA to, to protein. So selective is just an irrelevant answer. You can remove option D. In question 15 now, we're asked, which of the following types of tissues is most likely to be susceptible to cancer? So susceptible to cancer. Well, what is cancer? It's the quick growth of a bunch of cells without them differentiating properly. So it's the uncontrolled growth of cells. So a tissue type which would be likely to undergo some, some problem in the control of cell growth and then become susceptible, susceptible to cancer is one which normally already has a lot of growth. Just that's a normal part of what this tissue does. So we're looking for a type of tissue which does that, which grows on its own a lot. And then therefore, it's likely that something can go wrong in the mechanism which controls growth and then it'll grow even more so than it normally does. So a muscle tissue is not really a type of tissue which is known to grow a lot. So if the muscle isn't exercised a lot, it won't really grow that much. It can grow if the muscle is exercised a lot, but muscle tissues themselves are not really characteristic of a lot of growth. B, adipose tissue, same thing. They don't really grow that much. They're honestly only formed like when there is excess energy that needs to be stored, so they aren't grown that often. And then C, neural tissue, that's even less so. So neural tissues are really not known for dividing and growing a lot. So like they're regenerative method is not so it's not very well known so we have like a lot of problems when neurons get damaged how do we regenerate them so these are definitely not a type of tissue that are known to grow a lot but d epithelial tissues these are known to grow a lot so epithelial tissues are tissues that often will line some type of the wall of a lumen for example the the walls of your intestines are lined with epithelial tissues and these tissues are used to a lot of damaged by the different chemicals in your intestines as well as the mechanical churning of your intestines. So all of this wear and tear on the tissues does break away at this layer and they have to be able to quickly be replaced. So epithelial tissue is known to quickly grow and therefore this is the one which can most likely have a problem in its control of the growth and be susceptible to cancer. So D is the best answer for question 15. So that's it for the questions in this video. If you like what you saw, and if you want to see a lot more questions with the explanations and breaking down all the different answer options, then be sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.